Good day, everyone. Our program will begin in just a moment. Hello, everyone. We'll begin in just a moment. Good day and welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. In celebration of Jewish American Heritage Month, we are delighted and honored to be joined today by two beloved professors and award-winning authors, Dr. Laura Arnold-Liebman and Dr. Zev Elif, for a lively conversation about some little known but incredibly fascinating moments in American Jewish history. And moderating today's conversation is Dr. Laura Shaw Frank, director of AJC's William Petchik Contemporary Jewish Life Department. After we hear from our esteemed guests, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at AJC.org. That's questions plural, or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. And with that, Laura, the floor is yours. Welcome, everyone. So as many of you know, May has been designated by the United States government as Jewish American Heritage Month which is a month to celebrate the contributions that Jewish Americans have made to our country, as well as to learn about the richness of Jewish culture and tradition. And at a time when anti-Semitism has been targeting American Jews, and that's often taking up our headlines, we at AJC are really happy to be focusing this month, and specifically right now, on the resilience and creativity of American Jews and the powerful contributions they've made to this country. And I'm thrilled to be here today with two friends and incredible scholars of American Jewish history, Professors Zev Elif and Laura Arnold Liebman, to explore some really fascinating tidbits from the nearly 370 year history of the Jewish community in America. During our time together today, we hope you will be uplifted and inspired and that you will walk away with an enriched understanding of this tiny community that has had such an outsized role in making this country what it is today. So first, just a moment of introduction for our two experts today. Zev Elif is the president of Gratz College in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, A prolific scholar, Elif is the author or editor of nine books, many of which are on my shelf, and more than 50 scholarly articles in the field of Jewish studies and American religion. Elif's research in American Jewish history has received numerous awards, including the American Jewish Historical Society's Wasserman Prize and the Rockower Award for Excellence by the American Jewish Press Association. He's also a two-time finalist for the National Jewish Book Award, a member of the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society. And Laura Arnold Liebman is Professor of English and Humanities at Reed College. Her work focuses on how material culture changes our understanding of the role of women, children, and Jews of color in the early Atlantic world. Another prolific, prolific scholar, Liebman is the author of numerous articles and books, including, again, many on my shelf, uh, specifically The Art of the Jewish Family, A History of Women in Early New York and Five Objects, which won three National Jewish Book Awards, and Messianism, Secrecy, and Mysticism, A New Interpretation of Early American Jewish Life, which won a Jordan Schnitzer Book Award and a National Jewish Book Award. Known for her scholarship in digital humanities, Laura has served as the chair of the Digital Media Committee for the Association of Jewish Studies, AJS, and she's currently the vice president of programs for AJS. So welcome, welcome to Zev and Laura. Um, we're so excited to have you here. So before we jump into our moments in American Jewish history, I wanted to set the stage by asking both of you about your own connection to this field. You're both renowned and beloved very beloved scholars of American Jewish history. So I just wanted to ask each of you to just talk for a minute about what enticed you to devote your studies to this field. And let's start with Laura. Sure. So I actually came to the field a little bit late in life. I already had tenure by the time I started working in American Jewish history. And I began my career in Native American studies. And when I had finished up my first book, I was looking around for a new project and uh, at that point, my husband and I lived in Seattle, which has a very large Sephardic community. And I kept on getting questions from everybody in the community about like, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And a lot of those questions ended up pushing me into the book that eventually became Messianism, Secrecy and Mysticism. Uh, just as I was like, you know, great question. I would like the answer to that as well. And took a number of years of research, obviously, but once I started working on Jews in early America, I definitely became obsessed with it and have stayed with that that area in early American studies. It's amazing. Zev. My experience is exactly the opposite. So whereas 
Whereas Laura accidentally transformed what we know about colonial Judaism in her book, I, and, and later in her career, I was an undergrad and I edited and wrote yet another book on Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik. Exactly the opposite. Um, I think that would brought me to American Jewish history then to Brandeis to study with my even more beloved teacher, Jonathan Sarna, um, was the ability to make meaning. I'm, I'm an American Jew. Very often we write about what we're interested in. Our que the research questions we ask have to do with our own autobiography. We try to be as dispassionate as we can, but the questions I was asking and the archives I wanted to mine wanted me to explore dispassionately as I can possibly do, my community, although I probably know the least about my family than any other family in American Jewish history, uh, but to understand that's, that's really what it is. It's been sort of a personal quest to understand the community and the agencies to which it belongs. So I, I already see this commonality between your two stories, even though they're opposite. The two, the two stories, the commonality between the two stories is this moment, this making meaning, right? Is this kind of exploration of who are we? Who are American Jews? What, what can we uncover about our past that gives our past that gives meaning to our present? So without further ado, let's dive into some of those moments of the past. We had a lot of fun together brainstorming about what events we wanted to discuss. And it was of course, extremely, extremely difficult to narrow it down to 10. I think we managed to narrow it down to 12. We'll see if we get it to all of them. And the ones we chose gave, give a really broad picture of American Jews as individuals, but also about the American Jewish community and as we talk about these moments, we hope to give you out there, our audience, a so what about each one. Why is it important to American Jewish history as a whole to think about these moments? So without further ado, let's jump in. Laura, I'm gonna start with you. Your research focuses a great deal on these little told stories of individuals, often women and children, living their ordinary lives. These are not the people who make it into the, like, the you know, leaders of, great, of history kind of thing. They're the quiet stories. They're the stories that we often miss when we study history. So could you tell us about Hetty Hayes and her kosher boarding house? Sure, I, I feel like she's such a great example of the kinds of stories that came out of questions that people asked me about what about women in early American Jewish history. And Hetty Hayes was running a kosher boarding house in early New York in the 1770s, which I think is so important to know because first of all, it reminds us how important women were for maintaining Jewish life and Jewish ways of being religious in early America. But she's also not the first kosher boarding house. So like, I think for many people, it's like, what? There was a kosher boarding house in the 1770s. There's actually one in about 1710, 1720s as well in early New York. So Hetty Hayes comes to our into our knowledge in part because she gets involved in this kind of tragic um, kosher story that I think anybody who keeps kosher will definitely relate to in some ways. So she was running a kosher boarding house. She, her husband had been very knowledgeable, but she was widowed, and um, she gets a piece of meat from the local kosher butcher and slaughterer. And she's skeptical that it actually meets the halakhic requirements, the legal requirements for being kosher, because again, she's fairly knowledgeable and New York is a small community at this point. And she goes to the leaders of Sherith Israel, the early congregation in New York, and complains like, this doesn't look right to me. And the, fortunately, there's some visiting rabbis from London and other places at that particular point, other people in the know, and they confirm her suspicions and say, you are correct. This is not a kosher piece of meat. And they go to the kosher butcher. And often this was a position where it was somebody who had some knowledge, but maybe wasn't as knowledgeable as kosher butchers or slaughterers would be in, in Europe at the time. Again, very small community. And they read him the riot act that they say, you know, like, here's the things you need to be doing. You need to do these things better. And he sort of gets off with a mild rebuke, though he has to, he, it, he gets 
temporarily um, put on sort of hold for a while, but eventually he goes back to being a kosher slaughterer. But poor Hetty Hayes, as a result of this, has to re kosher her entire kitchen, which today is, for anybody who keeps kosher, a moment of huge trauma when this happens. But you can only imagine in early America before the age of blow torches and, and when things are hard to get, how incredibly difficult this would have been. And in the big picture things, like although she's the one who comes forward and recognizes things, she ends up suffering much more so than the kosher slaughterer does at the time. So I think, again, such a great example of how important women were to early American Jewish communities. We often talk about communities only really starting when you start to get women in families and you start to get this leading to the next generation as opposed to just individual people popping up. And such a good reminder of the role that women are playing, not only in family life, but in religious life. Amazing, just amazing. I wish we could talk to her, <laughs> hear, talk to, and, and hear her story from her mouth. It would be amazing. Zev, turning to you, one of the most fascinating things about early American Jewry is how this tiny minority, and it was a tiny minority, made its voice heard to the leaders of the new United States of America. So you're going to share with us a little anecdote about that. Go ahead. So everybody refers to the great Washington letter at the end of 1790. Uh, there's a prehistory to that. And it is important. There's a good dissertation to be written about the reception history and how it's used over time. Well, in a year prior to that, the Bill of Rights was authored. But it was no slam dunk that the Bill of Rights, which was the first document essentially to guarantee religious freedoms, would be ratified by the states. And so the Jewish community, as you write, Laura, probably no more than a thousand Jewish women and men are, live in the United States at that time before the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, the synagogues, remember, this is a very synagogue-centered Jewish community. So the synagogues led by uh, the leading one, which was Sheriff Israel in New York, tries to bring everybody together, congregations in Richmond and Charleston. It turns out the Georgians of Savannah had already reached out to uh, George Washington on their own, but to not plead, but to gesture to him. It might be a good idea to guarantee religious liberties. Well, New York was very slow to the take. And so Moses Satius in Newport, Rhode Island is the first one to write a letter. And it's that letter, not Satius's letter to Washington, but Washington's letter back, which is what people quote, to bigotry, no sanction. Well, that's not actually George Washington's language. It was already in, on, in August 1790, Satius in the New, uh, Newport, Rhode Island community asked, Will you give to bigotry no sanction? Newly uh, elected, really an election, uh, President Washington. And he responds in the reverse time and again uh, to guarantee these rights. Eventually, a conglomerate of congregations, already Savannah had written an author, the, the Georgians were very, uh, 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 I guess, precocious about sending first uh, to a very nonplus New York community, but New York, Richmond, Charleston, Philadelphia, excuse me, offer their own letter. Um, but it really does represent Jewish agency and the uncertainty of American Jewish life in the early Republic. And it's really important to underline that, the uncertainty of Jewish life in the early Republic, because, you know, we can get caught in this trap of, you know, our comfort with the American government today and look back and think that it this what we see in the past presaged it, but in fact, they didn't know what the, of the future would turn out to be. They're Jews in Philadelphia as they're meeting to design uh, the amendments in the Bill of Rights, basically uh, picketing uh, that Jews should receive their due religious liberties. And it really was no slam dunk at all. Indeed, indeed. It's really important to understand that. Laura, turning back to you, talking about complicating the past, another really important element of your work is complicating our notions of who American Jews are, their backgrounds, their multifaceted identities. You know, we can also get trapped in our moment today, imagining that Jews of the past in America were, you know, like we imagine the Jewish community is today, even though it really is much more diverse than we imagine it is today, that it's an Ashkenazi community from Eastern Europe that immigrated in the early 20th century. 
And your work really um, overturns a lot of the, those assumptions. Um, so tell us about Sarah Brandon Moses. Sure, I'm gonna share a screen with you because as you sort of alluded to, um, I'm really interested in objects and a lot of the work that I do. Let me just get to view full screen so that you can see all the glory that is her portrait. And um, so this is a, a woman named Sarah Brandon Moses. She, I think, is such a good example of what you're talking about. So she is a Sephardic Jew, but she also was born enslaved on the island of Barbados at the end of the 18th century. And she ends up traveling to Suriname where she converts to Judaism. And then she gets married in London at Bevis Marks. And she eventually makes her way to New York with her husband, who is a New York Jew. And she becomes, through the rest of her life, one of the wealthiest Jews in New York. And she's somebody who I've talked about both in The Art of the Jewish Family and my new book, Once We Were Slaves. But I, I think this, this ability to even see what she looks like in the past is so compelling, right? That we have this sense of her as being this sort of round personality um, and somebody who really is bridging these multiple port towns throughout the Americas. And a good reminder that when Jews came to New York, they often didn't stay there, first of all, that they moved around, but also that they brought all these different histories with them, that she's a really important reminder that that history of multiracial and Jews and Jews of color is really a long-standing one throughout the United States and the Americas. So definitely somebody I'm obsessed with and her portrait I think is so beautiful. It's a little ivory miniature that was made right before she got married. Um, and she died unfortunately right before she reached the age of 30, but not before she'd had 10 children. So she has a fair number of descendants who survive in the community today. Uh, just a question, did you speak to any of her descendants when you were doing research on her? Yeah, in fact, I've been um, recently in contact with some new descendants. So she also had a brother who also has an adorable, adorable miniature. I have to say I'm obsessed with the ivory miniatures from this time period. And I was actually just recently in contact putting together some different branches of the family. There had been some branches of the family that from the records we thought might be half siblings of Sarah and Isaac. And through DNA testing, the two branches of the family, once I connected them, were able to confirm, yes, that they actually were half siblings through a different mother. Um, and their family had also begun their lives enslaved in Barbados too, their ancestors. Wow. Wow. So it really complicates what we understand the Jewish past in America to be, and so important as we think about our present. So that's much more diverse than we understand it as well. Zev, I want to turn now to one of my favorites. It's really a head gra headline grabbing um, Jewish story from the 19th century about Isaac Mayer Wise, who's someone who became one of the most storied reform rabbis in American Jewish history. Could you tell us a little bit about that? You know, Wise, and it was a headline. It was called The Melee in the Albany Press, and it uh, centered on the person who would become the great architect of American Reform Judaism. So while as contemporary reporters in Albany called it the melee, we call it in no small way, one of the most pivotal moments in the creation of Reform Judaism in America. What happened? Uh, Isaac Mayer Wise was a young rabbi in Bethel Congregation, Albany, New York, one of uh, just a handful of congregations, even by that time uh, in 1850. He had auditioned, today we might call it a proba, uh, for a very important congregation, Beth Elohim uh, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Gustavus Poznanski was retiring and he got into a fight. Uh, this one was actually just a verbal fight with Rabbi Morris Raphael, who was about to start at BJ at B'nai Jeshurun, uh, was around already at that time. Uh, and it had started to make the rounds. New, we didn't have social media, newspapers were slower to read about the great debates between Raphael and Wise, but Bethel's uh, lay leader, the Parnas, the president of the congregation, Louis Spanier, had a relative in Charleston who informed him about Wise's um, opining about uh, the Maimonidean Creed, the 13 principles of faith. Apparently, Wise didn't believe in two of them, the resurrection of the dead and the return to Zion, and he confronted him. And two days later, 
uh, two days, excuse me, before Rosh Hashanah, Wise was fired for an overreach of rabbinic authority. Uh, well, he was fired. That means he didn't get to sit at the minister. That's what they called him in those days. Minister's position in the congregation. But his followers still offered to purchase for him the honor of uh, Petichah, of opening up the Aaron, the Holy Ark, uh, for Rosh Hashanah. Well, Spanier would have none of it, and he uh, blocked him. He interceded on his march upward to the uh, to the Ark, and he punched him. And Wise punched him back. And it resulted in a melee uh, in which, in uh, handcuffs, Wise was escorted to the local prison. He was out shortly thereafter. They observed two days of Yom Tov, of the holiday of Rosh Hashanah in those times. Shortly thereafter, Anche Emmet, the very first wise orchestrated Americanized reform synagogue. There were others. Baltimore and in New York, certainly in Charleston, was already moving to reform. But that was when Isaac, we Isaac Mayer Wise uh, started his own pulpit. You see the introduction of mixed pews, family style seating for the first time. Shortly thereafter, within three years, he's given a lifetime contract in Cincinnati. If it wasn't for Louis Spanier and his unbridled resentment, we may not have the very reformed Judaism we have today. That is just, it's such an amazing story about how one moment can be so transformative, especially a moment that was quite electric at the moment and, and that it happens. Oh, my goodness. But not if you have ever seen a board meeting in a synagogue. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, every once in a while, I hear about these fights that go on um, in synagogues, even to this day, about various things that... Uh, to the outsider might even seem very uh, minor, um, but actually end up being um, incredibly important in the moment and can lead even to blows, as we see. Um, Laura, turning back to you, one of the ways that people in the past tell their stories um, is through the material culture that they leave behind. And you showed us that the ivory miniature um, and you study that material culture and you find all these stories behind the artifacts that you research. And I have to say, when I read your work, I always think about like, what's the material culture that I have in my house that someday belongs in an archive and should be studied. Um, so I'm hoping you could tell us a little bit about a late 19th century Jewish women's sewing circles and what they can tell us also about the reform movement, actually, or maybe not only. Yeah, sure. So again, I'm going to go ahead and share screen because love the objects and want to share them. Um, let me go back to full screen again. And so one of the things that you've we've already sort of hit on is that role that women are having. And that's really women's role in American Judaism. And it's really changing over the course of the 19th century. And one of the women who's really just breaks tremendous ground in terms of women's position in American Judaism is Rebecca Gratz, Gratz College. Um, so Zev's, you know, much more good on Rebecca Gratz than I am, but and I'm sure he can add other things. But one of them, well, she does so many things, but one of the things that she does is really start um, these committees that end up being sort of morphing into um, the what will become sisterhoods later on in the 19th century that she's really sort of carving a new role for women both in education and in other aspects of jewish life including caring for the poor and caring for communities and one of the things that emerges out of that work is the creation of jewish ladies sewing circles and sewing circles are tremendously popular throughout the United States during the 19th century. And she, the first one that we see starts in the late 1830s in Philadelphia, growing out of the group that was spawned by Rebecca Gratz's work. And they spread rapidly all over across the country. And one of the things that we find them doing is using the women's talent in sewing both to create garments for the poor. So the one in Philadelphia um, a number of decades after it's begun is creating like over 500 garments for the Jewish poor a year, which is a phenomenal amount of sewing going on. But they also do kind of high end sewing that's really showing off in community building. And one of the things that they do is create these beautiful what are called album quilts that are quilts where the different squares are made by different women. This is a glorious example of one that's at one of my absolute favorite museums, which is hard to pick because I love so many of them, the Museum of Southern Jewish Experience. 
and it was created by the Jewish Lady Sewing Circle in Canton, Mississippi, which is a little town um, that's part of the cotton network. And there had been this horrible, horrible epidemic of yellow fever in Mississippi, and the synagogue had to close as a result and was really having financial problems. And the Jewish Lady Sewing Circle come together and raise funds by creating this quilt. And so they're really helping the synagogue reopening it back on the ground. Such a great example of women really using their power um, within congregations and within the objects that they're making to kind of heal communities. And we see this throughout the South and also in other instances in the North as well. Um, so just a, a really beautiful, beautiful example of this kind of artwork that's going on during this time period. That's absolutely so stunning. It's amazing. You really, I hope everybody realizes when Laura is doing this analysis, she's not reading, she's reading all of this into material culture. She's, I mean, the rest of us, we read archives, we read documents, we report the news very late. What Laura's, what, what Laura's doing is she sees all of that from the picture. But that's incredible. It is really incredible. And it actually, it's something that I feel like is can inspire all of us to look at, you know, so many of us have items of material culture, whether from Jewish history or not, or if you're not even Jewish, in our homes and in our family's histories, and to try to think about what the histories are behind those objects and what we can read into them is just an incredible thing to do. So yeah, and I, I'm, I'm always in awe of what you do with these material culture objects, Laura. Thank you. Zev, so, I'm gonna so go, go, ahead, go ahead. really quickly. Yeah, uh, yeah. Part of my obsession with the quilts has to do with the fact that I had read somewhere like somebody, very important, had said like, Jews don't really quilt. And I was like, oh my gosh, my grandmother used, made these beautiful quilts. She must have been a bad Jew. So I was like, so part of it did have to do with like, wait, but I've seen other Jewish quilts and really getting into them as a result. So I would totally echo you. Like when you see objects in your home that your family members have made and preserved and that made meaning for them to really think about um, how they connect you to the past and the kinds of things that people who came before you have done to create the communities that we have today. Yeah, especially because those stories are the hidden stories, right? We, as I was saying at the beginning, you know, so many of the stories that we study about uh, in history in general, and of course, also in American Jewish history, are these big, loud stories, the stories that are in all the history books. And there are so many quiet stories. There are so stories that are embedded in material culture. There are stories that that we don't necessarily know of individuals um, who acted in a very quiet way. And, and their stories are not necessarily recorded for history books, but they actually, without knowing those stories, we don't really get a full picture of what went on in the past. So it's a, it's an incredible thing to like find those, those small stories. And I, I know both Zev and Laura and your work, you've done an enormous amount of that. Um, it's so important. So speaking of, I guess, it's not really about small stories. These were big stories, but they are commonplace everyday uh, events or once a year events. Um, Zev, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the social culture of 19th century American Jews through the very storied Purim balls that American Jews held. So Meyer Isaacs, a uh, single young man still at that time, his father was the editor, Samuel Mayer Isaacs was the editor of the Jewish Messenger, was the minister, again, they didn't call them rabbis uh, still at this point, minister of Shari Tefillah, before that, B'nai Jeshurun. Uh, he and a circle of affluent young men decide that they are going to pattern what the Germans have uh, in the terms of the uh, uh, Liederkranz, what the French have in terms of Carnival, uh, they were going to invest, particularly because it was a cold time of year in which they didn't have these parties, he would invent the Purim ball. Uh, Purim wasn't, mentioned Rebecca Gratz, uh, she actually in her letters testifies that Purim wasn't much observed. It was, along with Hanukkah, one of the minor Jewish holidays. And they go very, as you point out, Laura, very, very big with with floor managers, bringing in opera houses, uh, bringing in lights and all sorts of different scenery. And it becomes a fancy dress ball, a costume ball. 
and it goes year in and year out. One important item, which I think several people have written about it, uh, what I like to point out is it happened at first outside of the synagogue. Mentioned Isaac Mayer Wise before. That was very much a contest for the soul of the synagogue. Before then, it was led by the lay authorities, the parnas, the president, the trustees. The rabbis were ready to take the synagogue. Well, here was another attempt, which really for other agencies, think about the AJC much, much later. But the notion that there should be Jewish organization outside of congregational life was something brand new. And so these Purim balls that invited the mayor and the police commissioner and other dignitaries to these balls, um, they wouldn't dress like Queen Esther or Mordechai. They dressed as the Queen of Hearts, as Little Red Riding Hood. That was really, really important. And so as these uh, Purim balls are popularized, the last place they really take root are in synagogues because they seem to be a very lay driven initiative. It becomes a major fundraiser for Jewish or non-Jewish causes. Uh, it's, it fits in the tapestry, the cult, the high-end culture of American life. And before you know it, they're in Philadelphia, in Baton Rouge, in Austin, Texas, in California. It makes sense because it synergizes Jewish sensibilities with American culture. And of course, synthesizing American Jews, Jews with American culture is such a theme in all of American Jewish history. My research, um, when I wrote my dissertation, as you both know, <laughs> um, was about American Jewish weddings. And gosh, the synthesis that was taking place there, material culture wise, in terms of white wedding gowns and flowers and, and presents lists yeah. and things like that, as well as the way they worked on the wedding ceremony to make it echo sort of American values of the time and democracy, ideas of democracy and freedom is just incredible, incredible to see. Um, so 100%, that is like one of the most important themes um, in American Jewish history. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna jump in for a second now to tell a story that's not such a happy story, um, but it's a story that I've been thinking about a lot because it is um, currently being portrayed on Broadway and also because it involves AJC um, in, in the history that happened here. And that's the lynching of Leo Frank. So I'm just gonna tell a little bit about that story before we continue. Um, because I think it's important for us to, in this moment of anti-Semitism, just at least mention one of the events that I think really um, colors our understanding of American anti-Semitism. Um, and this is an event that happened in 1913. So 1913, it's in Atlanta, Georgia, and a little girl, 13-year-old girl named Mary Fagan, who was working in a factory, the National Pencil Company factory in Atlanta, is found murdered, strangled. Um, it happened to have happened on Confederate Memorial Day, which was a day of you know, kind of a white supremacist kind of a feeling in the air, a day that made Jews very uncomfortable, certainly blacks also very uncomfortable. Um, and that's the day that the murder happened. Mary Fagan was was white, um, Irish. And a man named Leo Frank, who was the manager of the factory, um, was accused of the murder. And he was not the murderer. Um, later on, it came out that most likely the murderer was uh, 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 the janitor, um, Jim Conley, um, who is actually black, which is interesting because you would have thought that it appears, particularly in that period in the South, that the black janitor would have been framed with the murder immediately. And it's fascinating that the Jew was the one who was framed uh, with the murder. Um, and, and historians think that that was a lot about because there was a whole conversation taking place at that time and Jews were very involved in about working class people versus capitalists and the Northern capitalist, Leo Frank being the Northern Jew, um, they were kind of seen as exploiting these, these poor Southern people. And so Leo Frank is framed with this murder. And there was a ton of anti-Semitism that crawled out from under the carpet when he was framed, including at the trial, all these anti-Semitic epithets, crowds outside yelling, hang the Jew. Um, the governor had to put the National Guard on standby actually to, to ensure that there was, um, that they, were, that, that they protected him. Um, and, you know, Leo Frank was convicted of the murder, ultimately. The AJC part of the story is fascinating. Behind the scenes, AJC, which had really been founded only a few years before, um, AJC was asked to help out with the Leo Frank defense. And they were really worried about doing this. 
they were worried about it because they felt like if the AJC came out, which is a storied American Jewish organization already, even in its in its infancy, if they came out in support of this man, what would it look like? It would change the conversation into a conversation about Jews and power, and perhaps even uplift and increase um, anti-Semitism. So what AJC ends up doing is very quietly raising money for his Leo Frank's defense on the side. And in fact, Louis Marshall, who's our president, ended up quietly engaging in his defense um, as an attorney, he was a storied attorney. So anyway, Leo Frank is convicted of the murder, imprisoned, and the governor of Georgia realizes that he's not guilty. And he commutes his sentence after a great outcry all around the country about uh, this wrongful conviction. Um, he commutes his sentence and moves him because he knows there's so much anti-Semitism going on at that time. They move him to this like farm prison where he'll supposedly be safe. And amazingly and horrifyingly, in this farm prison where he's going to be freed because the sentence is commuted, um, this group of white supremacists breaks into the prison and they capture him, they kidnap Leo Frank, and they hang him. And it's this moment of just horrendous um, fear for American Jews as they see in their photographs of it, they're very awful, of Leo Frank hanging on a tree with people watching um, and kind of gawking at the spectacle. And um, actually in the wake of the Leo Frank lynching, the ADL was founded to act as another organization combating anti-Semitism in America. So it's an awful story, um, but it's a story that talks about the struggles in the moment of American Jewish organizations to fight anti-Semitism when they don't want to increase it at the same time and they want to be effective in their in their fighting. And it's a story I think about all the time in this moment as Jewish organizations in America are trying to grapple um, with anti-Semitism. I hope we will never see a lynching again, but unfortunately we've seen quite a bit of violence in the past few years. And it's definitely something that in the moments, like this is something I think about as someone who's a student of Jewish history all the time, like, you know, in the moment, you never know if you're doing something right. And when you look to the back to the history and see how organizational leaders, how Jewish leaders thought about things in the past and how they tried to fight about things, again, like we were talking about earlier, we know the end of the story, right? We know that the George Washington letters, for example, ended up the Jews are okay. The Jews were protected by the Bill of Rights. They were protected by the Constitution. They were protected by government. Um, but but in the moment, we don't necessarily know if we're doing the right thing. So, okay, wanted to raise that story. Speaking of contested issues and difficult issues, I'm going to turn back to you, Zev. Our country has had so many disagreements uh, about immigration and immigration law and immigration policy throughout our history, and indeed, even in the past few years. And even in this very moment, we're having huge, huge arguments about immigration and what should be done. And Jews have been really impacted by changing immigration policies in lots of profound ways in American Jewish history usually we were excluded by immigration laws. Um, I mean, when laws changed, there was a period when we were very welcomed by immigration laws, but when laws changed, when there were contested moments, often that meant that the contested moment resulted in Jewish exclusion. Can you share with us the little known story of the rabbi clause that led to a very different outcome in 1924? The Johnson Reed Act of 1924, the Immigration Act of 1924, which was preceded by other acts, which were designed to create quotas from certain regions of Europe, uh, looked specifically to exclude Jews from Eastern Europe. It was no small thing at all. Um, also included Clause 4D. 4D in 1924 read, aliens who are professional actors, artists, lecturers, singers, nurses, ministers of any religious denomination, professors for colleges or seminaries, aliens belonging to any recognized learned profession or aliens employed as domestic servants may, if otherwise admissible, be admitted notwithstanding this quota meaning that while the Johnson Reed Immigration Act 1924 was looking to limit undesirables to the United States, this fear of the uh, of these foreigners, uh, they still there was a supply and demand concern. Well, Americans still needed to have uh, servants, or in the case of the Rabbi Act, they needed to have trained ministers and professors in their Protestant, or Catholic seminaries, who the best of them 
we're from Europe. So you can't by any means, ex can't throw out the baby with bathwater. And so because of that, Abraham Joshua Heschel was able to migrate uh, after 1924. And if I just read just for fun, a list of the Orthodox, who I should say many of Orthodox reform and conservative, the jig is up. Where are we gonna get our learned scholars from? The Hebrew Union College, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the Rabbi Isaac Ochanan Theological Seminary, they were good, but the best of our rabbinic leaders still came to us were imports from Europe. And certainly there was much to do in the Orthodox community because REITs and what would eventually be called Yeshiva University had yet produced that level of Americanized effective rabbinate. So because of this clause, Clause 4D, I'll read you just a list uh, that was produced in an article that uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna and I co-authored. Samuel Bulkin, Chaim Blach, Eliyahu Meyer Blach, Joseph Breuer, um, Chaim Fischel Epstein, Moshe Feinstein, Kutiel Greenwald, Ruben Grzovsky, Chaim Heller, Yosef Hengen, Yitzchel Kuttner, Nissen Yablonsky. Um, yo, I'm, I'm skipping them because there are too many. Yaakov Kamenetsi, Chaim uh, Yitzchak Korb, Rav Aaron Cutler, Israel Abraham Abba Krieger, David Lifshitz. Uh, the list goes on and on. Rav Yaakov Ruderman, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, his father-in-law, the sixth rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson, Shimon Schwab, Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, his father Moshe Soloveitchik, the Satmar Rav, Yoel Teitelbaum, all of these people were able to avoid the very restrictive quota because of Clause 4D. The exception ended up transforming American Judaism in between the war years. That is unbelievable. And, and by the way, not just American Judaism, but let's take a second to realize it hmm. actually transforms Jewish history writ large, because had those people remained in Europe, they likely would have been murdered in the Holocaust. And these people came to America and transformed American Judaism, but they also transformed Jewish philosophy, Jewish thinking. I mean, Menachem Menzel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I mean, transformed world Judaism. They all did in such profound ways. It's an incredible, incredible moment where you think about the sort of unintended consequences of this tiny little law um, that can end up really changing the world in such a profound way. Okay, I'm going to do one more, um, and then I want to make sure we have time for questions. Maybe we'll do two more. Let's see how we do. Um, okay, so Laura. I don't want our audience to think the Jewish community was always unified because gosh forbid, we should look into the past and say, oh my God, they were all so unified and we're so fractured today. In fact, they were just as fractured as we are. Um, so could you tell us a story of one of those moments of friction, the Chicago kosher meat boycott? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll share screen again. Um, uh, so one of the things that I think is such a good example of that sort of fracturing happens in the 1930s in Chicago, um, over in the sort of Lawndale area, so sort of over in here. And um, this was the West Side Jewish community. It was the largest Jewish community in Chicago at the time. And as you can see from this map of Chicago's ganglands from 1931, there was a lot of organized crime in Chicago at the time, and Jews were also involved in organized crime. And it didn't just impact their everyday lives, it also impacted religious lives. And we know that one particularly problematic area was when the racketeering um, members of the Chicago Jewish gangs started to take over the union for kosher slaughterers. And this became such a problem in terms of inflating the prices and honestly just also adding corruption into what should be a really sacred aspect of Jewish life that although we've had plenty of other kosher boycotts in the past that were led by women this time the rabbinate actually stepped in and they're they're really putting their lives at risk and they're very transparent about that about how even speaking out against the gangs and what they're doing could cause them to be killed. And they call for a kosher uh, boycott of kosher chickens at the, the last few days of 1930. And it lasts for eight days into 1931. 
over there's about 350,000 Jews in in Chicago at that particular time over a hundred thousand dollars worth of revenue is lost but the boycott works and they actually get the very corrupt gangster who's on in charge of the union for the ritual slaughterers out of he gets cast out there's a new board that um gets um voted in and they are able to restore order to the kosher industry in Chicago. So I put also this picture of a gentleman who's my great grandfather who lived and worked in the neighborhood in a kosher bookshare shop. So for me, like super personal, right? Like that, you know, that he's one of the people who lived in fear of who was going to be in charge ultimately, um, the sort of Jews who are running corruption or the Jews who are really struggling to make the city safe on so many different levels. Wow, that's such a crazy story to think about the the internal workings of the Jewish community around an area that's incredibly important to organize Jewish life, and yet is like, actually shows a very unseemly and seamy um, a, a view of what might what was going on in the Jewish community at the time. But also, I wanna just really quickly is, also it's not just Louis Brandeis and Jewish labor laws, but the element of striking uh, yeah. I mentioned before the rabbi, the students of the Rabbi Isaac Alchanan Theological Seminary, Reitz, now Yeshiva University, they strike because they're not getting any jobs because all the JTS ordained rabbis are getting the traditional synagogue. So they strike around the exact same time in order to force the administration to add Jewish history and other and professional training and, uh, and oratory into the curriculum. So striking as a device to augur change. I'm not going to say it's a very Jewish thing, but Jews in America are very aware of its power. Indeed, that's true. And of course, we can't forget all of the garment worker strikes that went on in the early 20th century, particularly involving Jewish women, but Jewish men as well. So many of them worked in the garment industry and they made enormous, enormous change. So yes, that's, we could write a whole book just about strikes. Indeed, we could. Um, okay, I actually... Um, trying to decide what to do now. I feel like we maybe should turn to questions. Um, although, you know what? Ugh. Zev, I'm just going to ask you to quickly tell us one more story because we can't not tell a story about Jews and sports because, you know, sports oh. are so important in Jewish history, not. But um, could you just quickly tell us about Sandy Koufax? This is actually a mishistory, is that it's, it's almost sacrilege. Uh, to not point out the 1965 World Series and Sandy Koufax's decision to pitch not game one, but game two. But I want to offer some context to it. Number one, Don Drysdale, who pitched game one and eventually lost, was a Hall of Famer too. I want to put just some context along with it about the decision and why it was or was not known. Uh, first of all, Drysdale was selected over Koufax because Drysdale hadn't pitched in over four days and they wanted to keep him warm. Number two, the Dodgers were a heavy favorite over Harmon Killebrew's twins. So they didn't think, they thought they were going to sweep them. Money was that they would sweep them. Uh, in addition, it was supposed to rain that day. So it was supposed to be a non-issue. Another interesting moment is the day after, the only person who seemed to actually care that much was a Rabbi Moshe Feller who found, we have contemporaneous documents that found Koufax at his hotel in, in Minnesota and bequeathed him a pair of tefillin already by 1965. Koufax loses game two, five to one. He ends up shutting out the twins uh, in the subsequent games. Also point out that as long as Koufax were to have pitched game one or two, he would get three opportunities to pitch. So he pitches game seven, eventually goes to a seven game series and the Dodgers win. Koufax claims his second World Series MVP. What's interesting about all of this, this collected data, is that when you look about when Jews start to care about Sandy Koufax not pitching, it's not until the late seventies. If you look at the Jewish press, mm -hmm. they celebrate here is this the lefty has won his second, uh, second World Series MVP. His Dodgers now have uh, beaten, have a triumph over the, in the era of Mickey Mantle. But it's interesting to note that you don't find serious discussion about this critical moment in Jewish history until much, much later. Fascinating. It's, you know, of course, people make the story important when it's important for something of some other reason. And they. I'm going to get hate mail. It's going to be, I shouldn't have done this. 
Um, you know, we have about 11 minutes left. Uh, we've got to turn. We're getting a lot of audience questions. Um, so we want to turn to questions. Um, so Daniel, um, you want to share some of the questions with us? Sure. Thank you, Laura. And our first question, I'll, I'll lump these two together. We got one from Stephen Miller in San Francisco and from David Simon in Houston. So Stephen was asking if you could speak a little bit about General Grant's General Order Number 11 in 1862, uh, which expelled Jews as a class from the territory he controlled, and maybe any other uh, Jews in the Civil War stories. And then David Simon was asking if you can share any knowledge or stories about the former treasurer of the Confederacy and former US Senator from Louisiana. Hmm. Okay, who does anyone want to take that one? I mean, I, I'm happy to jump in, but I'm going to defer to our experts. Zev, go ahead. You want to jump in? You talk the about General Orders 11. The most obnoxious order, according to Ulysses S. Grant's wife. Um, and there's a whole book when General Grant expelled the Jews. Uh, by right over John, here on my shelf. By John, well, it's a very good library. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the um, uh, the long it, it, it's it's worth a book. Uh, to talk about um, U.S. Grant, uh, which signifies uh, which uh, signifies really the first anti-Jewish uh, legislation, uh, expels all Jews from his military encampment. Uh, what's also very important, as soon as he finds out, President Lincoln uh, reverts; he, he changes. He declares so. Very few people are actually affected by it, although and Jews come to the rescue. In all likelihood, uh, Grant. It was a case of psychological displacement theory. Um, Jews were involved with his father to scuttle cotton from the South to the North. Well, Ulysses S. Grant couldn't punish Jesse Grant, so instead he punished the Jews, it's thought to believe. But it does represent, uh, you know, uh, in, in both sides of the war, referred to Jews as this unkind other group at the time. So it does um, represent, betoken something much larger about uh, anti-Jewishness at that time. Great. And the other question about the senator, I actually must confess, I'm not familiar with that story. So I don't know if someone wants to do some quick research or if one of you know, know about him. I'm assuming it was a him. I don't think there were any her senators yet at that time. But while we think about that one, I have to inject my, um, my favorite uh, Civil War story. And I kind of wish I had I could put this up on the screen, but I did not prepare it. There's this wonderful uh, a picture that Jonathan Sarna writes about in his um, American Judaism, History of American Judaism, of a picture of Max Lilienthal, who was a very storied rabbi in America at the time, um, who was a Northern rabbi, and some Southern Jewish Confederate soldier scrawled across the picture, which was in the homes of many Jews in America. And he scrawled across the picture something like, you know, I never want to speak to you again. You're horrible. You're an embarrassment to the Jewish people. You're an embarrassment to America. How could you be a Northerner? How could you be against slavery? And all these terrible things. And then at the end of his letter, the scroll to cross Max Lilienthal's face, he writes, but if you ever want to be in touch with me, here's my address. And to me, that like captures civil war and Jewish history, uh, American Jewish history, which is that Southern Jews were Southern. They fought for the Confederacy. Some were slave owners, et cetera. Northern Jews were Northern. They were against slavery. They fought for the North. Most Jews lived in the North. But in the end, they also felt this connection across borders to one another. Yeah. Um, so whether it be Benjamin part. Franklin Jonas from Louisiana or Judah Benjamin, uh, it's important to recognize is that uh, Jewish brothers uh, fought each other. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of the American Jewish experience uh, is that uh, Jews were everywhere. They migrated in certain directions um, and politically were not of one mind, certainly. Great. Great, great, great. Uh, so we're talking about Judah Benjamin. Is that U.S. senator? I thought it was. I, I thought it was Benjamin Jonas uh, yes. from Louisiana, who was uh, much more observant religiously uh, than Judah Benjamin. Could be. Um, um, scholars like to focus on the northern soldiering uh, than in the southern, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, <laughs> but there's what to discuss. Yeah. Really fascinating, Daniel. What else you have for us? Sure. So I think with limited time, this is I think this is a good one that we can end on where we can actually share two more stories. But from Sue Stoloff on Zoom, if you could share with non-Jews one story that shows how Jewish Americans have impacted American life, what would that be? Ooh. Wow. That's a great question. So do you want me to leap in? I was gonna say, so I also was looking at that. I was like, ooh, I like that question. Um so I'll leap in just because why not? 
We have limited time. Um, one of the things that I, and this was something I had hoped we'd get to, but we didn't. And I would say is when I'm teaching just regular American studies classes is always like such an eye-opening moment. Um, is I would say like comic books and the creation of Superman that I feel like he's such an iconic American figure. And it's hard to imagine American popular culture without that contribution. But Jews were so important to the early comics industry and just really reshaped like how Americans thought of heroism. And it, in that sense, like had such an enormous impact on just everyday life. When I teach American graphic novels or American comics courses, it's impossible not to like have so much of the early work be about Jews and even later ones as well, right? That it ends up feeling like uh, this, the running theme throughout it is Jews contribution to American popular culture. And I think, again, such an iconic aspect of American life and yet really indebted to aspects of Jewish folklore of like things like the golem that are going to like come and save us. Like what kind of ways can we have this mythic um, entity that's going to come in and rescue us in times of trouble? And I, I had had pictures of from the 1940s of different American action heroes and comics punching Hitler. And really, you see the comic book heroes urging the US to get into the war and to really defend Jews um, and other peoples from what's going on. Wow. Amazing. I was going to say Seinfeld, but I'm with Laura now. Um, but I'm also <laughs> thinking what's interesting is that if you want, I forget, I think it was Superman Returns. It begins where he's in a position in outer space and he is his body's positioned like he is on a crucifix which is interesting is that is he a Moses figure who is rescued uh, by an adopted family uh, out from the Nile at Smallville, Kansas, or is he a Christological figure uh, who is there to save humanity? This, I, don't want, I don't want to suggest reappropriation. And certainly Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, the creators of men, were, were Jewish, Jewish kids from Cleveland. Um, they were part of the immigrant experience. Uh, but Superman is such a useful um, illustration of shared um, shared vision, um, shared beliefs, and also the ability, we mentioned synthesis, so the ability for Jews and Christians to understand the same folk here, the same mythical figure, the same but different. I'm going to go Superman. Amazing. I'm just going to add one sentence, which is to build upon what both of you just said. AJC just had an incredible exhibit about the work that we did using comics and 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 commercials and jingles and all kinds of things to fight hate and discrimination, using superheroes and all kinds of other things to sort of embed American values into this fight against anti-Semitism and, of course, fighting against all different kinds uh, of hate. And um, and that work really, I think, has also profoundly profoundly impacted America. Not just AJC's work in that area, but so many. Uh, the work of so many individual Jews, as well as so many Jewish organizations sort of using pop culture in a way that made America kind of live up to its best self in ways that it, it didn't always do. And still to this day, it doesn't always do. So I just want to thank you both so much. This was so much fun. And I think that we've painted a picture of a diverse, creative, resilient, feisty, um, and and um, endlessly relevant American Jewish community, which is exactly the kind of portrait that we want to paint in this Jewish American Heritage Month. And um, hopefully these stories will, will continue to enthrall us and encourage us to learn more about the history of uh, the American Jewish experience, which is so, so profound. And of course, we've shared so little of it um, with you today. So thank you so, so, so much, Dr. Zev Elif, Dr. Laura Arnold Liebman. You are both amazing. I feel very honored to call you both scholars, uh, scholars of mine, teachers of mine, mentors of mine, and friends. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over now to Daniel. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our global audience for joining us today. As Laura said, you can continue to join AJC in the celebration of Jewish American Heritage Month. And to learn more, you can visit AJC.org slash Jewish American Heritage Month. You can see the link there in the chat. Uh, again, that's AJC.org slash Jewish American Heritage Month. And lastly, there is still time to register for AJC Global Forum, which is taking place in Tel Aviv from June 11th through 14th. And you can register today at AJC.org slash Global Forum. Again, ajc.org slash global forum. The link is there in the chat and registration will officially close on June 5th. So 
now is the time to register. Dr. Laura Liebman, Dr. Zev Elif, and Dr. Laura Shaw Frank, thank you all so much and wishing everyone a very good week.